Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our next session. Welcome to all of you who are following in your office, at home, wherever, virtually. And also, yeah, now in the room, everyone is settling in. Um, the president of the EU Commission today said the relationship between China and the EU is simultaneously one of the most challenging we have and one of the most um, strategically most important ones. I'm delighted that we have two experts now to explore this further with Europe. Um, we've got two people I hardly need to introduce. Um, in Beijing, um, I'm delighted to welcome Jörg Wutke. He is the president of the European Chamber of Commerce. It's actually his third term, so he's, he's an old China hand. Welcome. And in the US, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Ryan Haas, um, at, who's expert at the Brookings Institution. And he's, we've, got, we've got some sound issues here. Sorry, I keep hearing myself. Yeah, that's, that's being resolved. Lovely. Um, Ryan Haas from the Brookings Institutions, who's also an advisor um, to Joe Biden, which I think will be a very interesting um, field uh, to explore. Um, just in the session before, we heard something very interesting. The big question is, how can Europe exert influence? Jörg Woodkin, China, what is, your, what is your take on EU-China relationship at the moment? Where are we? Well, thanks for getting the night shift in this session. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be with Marix and uh, uh, I'm really happy to share this uh, afternoon session already with Thomas Bucker and other friends. Well, where are we? Basically, we are uh, in a very deep economic relationship. Uh, if you just look at uh, the trade, uh, it's a billion euro a day to uh, uh, China, Europe, wow. and then 500 million uh, euro a day goes uh, to China. So it's very deep. Uh, Mika was asking me the outlook of the European uh, business community, and it's even better uh, because China in the next 10 years, uh, by conservative uh, uh, estimations, stands for 30% of global growth. Uh, and in chemistry, my own field, it's even more pronounced at 60%. So if you're not at the table, you're gonna be on the menu. Uh, we have in the chamber launched last week, uh, the position paper um, that had uh, uh, 410 pages as usual, it's a monster. Uh, but we have a very interesting uh, study in there from the World Bank, uh, it shows GDP per capita in PPP terms, and it shows that China has not been out there outshining everyone else and everyone else, I mean, Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, uh, it actually followed the path. Um, and we have three scenarios there about the future. All three scenarios, of course, are up because China is actually quite behind the, uh, in, in GDP terms per capita. Uh, but it also shows uh, that actually China over the last two years was falling behind these other three regions when you compare from the day of opening up of their economy. So what we were urging as an outlook of the European business in China is, you know, China don't get complacent, you're actually behind the curve, you're punching below your weight. Um, and uh, I've been trying to tell this to the Vice Premier last week, uh, and at least he noted it, uh, didn't say much about it. Uh, at the same time, uh, of course, Outlook is, I mean, look at my own company. We are now implementing, since three years, the largest uh, foreign direct investment ever in single investment. It's $10 billion, 100%. That shows the commitment as well as the trust uh, in the future there. Uh, we built it in Guangdong just to give people a taste of what Guangdong is all about. Not only do they have 100 million people, they have the GDP of Russia, and uh, Shenzhen has the GDP of South Africa. So when you ask yourself, you know, do we diversify? Do we look at other markets? You know, I just, where do I move? There is no second China. Uh, and that makes the whole thing so damn difficult. Uh, second uh, is the customer. I mean, the middle class is getting really demanding. You see this in the car industry, how our car companies from Europe are developing most of the uh, cars here, uh, because that's where the gadget rich uh, people are sitting. 
The average age for a consumer of Mercedes, first time buyer in Germany is 53 years, whereas in China is 35 years. In many ways, it's not really R&D and labs that brings us forward. It's just a very, very demanding Chinese customers. And we need that in order to compete uh, globally. Uh, the big uh, uh, issue that we have uh, since about two years, three years, is uh, the political uh, involvement uh, in business. Um, it's not just uh, uh, the, the party cells that are intruding in our operations, but of course the big picture has a definite uh, setback for us. Uh, the uh, problem in Hong Kong, uh, the national security law that was implemented there, and then of course uh, Xinjiang, if you look into forced labor supply chains, it's, it's really difficult. So in a way, uh, European business feels increasingly between a rock and a hard place. Uh, whatever we do, we possibly are gonna do it wrong. And that's why the chamber is uh, engaged in order to actually communicate the challenges there. Uh, the outlook, of course, is also that we are constantly bombarded by nice speeches, promises, go out, Davos stand for it. And uh, we developed in the chamber a word for it. It's called uh, promise fatigue, um, because we don't like uh, to have, again, a short and negative list and, and this and that, and have to be grateful of something that means very little to us. As a matter of fact, we want a deal. We want something with milestones. We want something committed. We want WTO 2.0, and that's the investment agreement. And I must say, it looks slightly grim. Um, so in a way, I, I don't know, is it okay if I shall carry on with the questions that uh, uh, Mika was throwing at me, or if you're going to take over there? I think we'll leave it at that, because you, you've already mentioned so many issues that we could take up, and I want to... Uh, to sort of follow them up later, um, you've already given us a great flavor of what is going on, of what is going wrong from a European point of view. I would like to um, bring in uh, Ryan for a very brief introduction and then we'll uh, sort of deepen some of the issues you've, you've mentioned. Thank you very much. Ryan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Silky, for including me in this discussion. I've, uh, I've already benefited tremendously listening to uh, the perspective from Beijing. I've been asked to share a few thoughts on the view from Washington. And so I will provide my own personal perspective that doesn't reflect any institution or organization, just my own uh, thoughts and provocations uh, to try to uh, stir up a useful conversation because I think that's where the real value uh, of our session will be. Uh, with your permission, I'm going to try to tackle three questions that, uh, that Miko tasked me with. Uh, and I will do so each in one or two minutes. Uh, the, the first question, where is the Chinese ship of state pointed and where is it going? Uh, the second question is, how will China policy develop following the outcome of the U.S. presidential election? And then the third question is, what does the U.S. see as Europe's role and transatlantic coordination in shaping China's choices? So on the first question of where, where is China going, uh, my general sense is that China is off balance right now, both at home and abroad. And that sense is fortified uh, listening to Mr. Wuka's comments. Um, China appears to be abandoning the formula that enabled its tremendous historic success for the past four decades. That formula had three basic elements. Uh, the first was to maintain a generally stable relationship with the United States. Second, to maintain a rather benign periphery to avoid bandwagoning against its rise. And then the third was to steadily, incrementally, but persistently reform and open uh, its economy to the outside world. And I think you could argue reasonably that on all three of those levels, China is off track right now. And on top of that, uh, Beijing appears to be reckless in its determination to impose its will upon a expanding uh, list of figures. At home, it includes businessmen, bureaucrats, Uyghurs, Tibetans, um, business leaders, lawyers, Hong Kong protesters, and now apparently also ethnic Mongolians. And I expect that list will continually grow. And it, it, it feels like Beijing's excessive assertiveness is a blinking red warning light of its insecurities, but I'm not entirely confident in my ability to diagnose what is triggering uh, those insecurities at the moment. In any event, I think the net effect uh, of Beijing's behavior at home and abroad is to make China become, or at least feel, uh, more isolated in the developed world. 
China simultaneously is experiencing friction with the United States, with Canada, Australia, many parts of the European Union, Australia, Japan, India. This isn't a, uh, a picture of successful diplomacy. Um, and so I expect the, the more Beijing feels like doors are closing for it in the developed world, the more it will seek to push for advantages in areas where it feels like doors are still open to it. In Southeast Asia, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, Russia, Africa, and Latin America primarily. And even though this approach will be more by default than by design, I think it will cause China to seek to consolidate uh, its gains, uh, particularly with Belt and Road Initiative partners, and to try to deepen uh, relationships where, where opportunities exist. I expect this trend will carry forward for at least the next six months and, and perhaps beyond. But that brings me to the second question that Miko tasked me with, which is how will the US election impact these developments. And I think that part of the nature of China's approach to the rest of the world will be informed by its relationship with the United States and by the outcome of the U.S. election. But frankly, I have no idea, zero uh, idea, who is going to win uh, the U.S. presidential election. If President Trump wins, I expect that there would be broad continuity in uh, the overall approach in a second term. Uh, I think his policy generally would be guided by a belief that the United States and China are locked into a deep philosophical and ideological struggle where there will be a winner and a loser. And I think that there would continue to be a belief that uh, US and Chinese values, interest and vision are irreconcilably at, at odds with each other. And so United States power must be organized to prevent China from achieving its ambitions. If on the other hand, Joe Biden becomes America's next president, I expect that there would be some continuity and some change in America's overall approach towards China. Uh, first, I don't think that there would be any effort to try to turn back the clock to 2016 to revive and restore uh, President Obama's China policy. I'm not aware of a single person in the United States that is advocating that approach. Uh, the United States has changed, China has changed, the world has changed, and I think everyone recognizes and appreciates that fact. Uh, second, I think that competition would remain the dominant feature of the overall relationship, but the nature and focus of that com uh, competition likely would shift uh, under a Biden presidency. Whereas uh, President Trump's approach has been pretty passionate, uh, I expect the Biden administration's approach would become more dispassionate. Whereas the Trump administration's approach has been built on notions of toughness and projecting strength and resolve, and trying to use uh, unilateral pressure uh, to compel capitulation. I think a Biden administration's approach would be organized more around questions of effectiveness and about questions of how China fits within the problem set that Joe Biden is most focused on addressing. And whereas the, the Trump administration's approach has been grounded in the idea of deep ideological struggle, and this is reflected daily in comments that Secretary Pompeo and others make, I think a Biden administration's approach would implicitly start from a judgment that the Chinese Communist Party is not on the cusp of collapse and isn't going anywhere. And we're going to need to figure out a way to coexist uh, with China. So in that spirit, I, I would just offer four quick points of departure that I, I think would be most likely in a Biden administration. First, a, a focus on revitalizing ties with America's allies and partners. Second, a prioritization on getting America's affairs in order at home and abroad. Uh, third, an effort to return values promotion uh, and democracy promotion and rule of law to the center and core of American foreign policy. But at the same time, and this is fourth, a, a desire to preserve some space, some limited capacity for coordination between the United States and China when it serves our interest. So ultimately, I, I expect that a Biden administration would focus on rebuilding America's strength, finding its friends, reclaiming America's position as a, a moral and economic leader, and then re-engaging China from a position of, of greater relative strength. So this leads me to the, the final uh, thought that I just wanted to put on the table before we, we let the conversation uh, run its course, which is what are the implications for Europe? My perspective from sitting in Washington is that I think that the geometry between the United States, the EU, and China will evolve a bit depending upon the outcome of the US presidential election. If Trump is elected, um, I think that there would be drift towards greater equidistance between the three parties. 
And I know I, I listened carefully to what Mr. Bagar was saying in the last panel. I know that that isn't a word that's often used, but I think just as a observable reality, I think that would be the, the outcome. Uh, if Biden is elected, I expect that there would be an effort to try to tighten transatlantic coordination on China. Uh, I think that this realignment would be enabled by a greater shared comfort between Washington and, and European capitals and working together to develop issues-based balancing coalitions to balance problematic Chinese behavior with pragmatism, but not with ideology or malice. Uh, I think this approach would not be based on populist unilateralism or pursuit of regime change. It would be driven by efforts to make step-by-step incremental progress in building common positions and common actions on China in areas where interests align. So I think that this would be more of a interest and issues-based alignment, not some type of unified field theory, uh, you know, grand alignment of strategies for countering China. Uh, the key point is that the more that uh, various parties can come to common messages and common actions for addressing Chinese problems, the harder it's going to be for, for China to ignore external concerns about its behavior. I could see such pressure being exerted, for example, to good effect in pressuring Beijing to protect Hong Kong's media freedoms and judicial independence, or pushing for greater market access in specific uh, parts of the Chinese economy that are limited to outside competition, or potentially addressing concerns over overcapacity over production. These, these are just illustrative examples. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that if, if Joe Biden is elected, I think that there would be a lot of interest from Washington in putting the diplomatic wheels of transatlantic coordination back in motion on China and in listening to good ideas from our friends in Europe about where such efforts should and could focus. So uh, my hope is that through discussions such as ours today, we can begin to build greater definition around where a, a healthy, pragmatic, future-oriented transatlantic agenda on China should focus. And with that, I'm, I'm very interested in hearing everyone's thoughts and perspectives and reactions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I mean, you, you clearly painted a picture of potential for transatlantic cooperation on China if, if Biden wins. Yeah, good. I'd be interested to hear, do you actually consider the US election such a big event as, as we just heard? Does it, from a business kind of uh, point of view, it, are you, are you sort of uh, eagerly awaiting the outcome and you think it's going to make much of a difference for, for the companies uh, you represent? Well, as a European, I can, of course, as a watcher with great anxiety, I can only hope for a change in the White House. But as a businessman in China, uh, as uh, Ryan pointed out, I guess there's very little change uh, going to happen. So I have to deal pretty much uh, with the same atmosphere, possibly of decoupling. Uh, and uh, the chamber uh, is actually working on a study that we launched uh, in the second week of uh, January about uh, uh, decoupling US, China, what it does to business. We do it deliberately, of course, a couple of days before. So we hope Biden is gonna get inaugurated. And uh, so what will happen for European business here, decoupling is fact. Uh, the Chinese started it with the internet and the kind of keeping uh, foreign companies out. And then of course, trade trade flows. Uh, Trump administration started a trade war. China actually reluctantly uh, responded. Uh, um, and of course, uh, when we looked into the initial impact this will have, uh, I think the chamber wants to really make it clear that this will lead to a massive cost increase for everyone uh, and to, to a, a dramatic uh, slowdown in global trade. Uh, we possibly think about uh, pre-WTO trade flows because China has made it very clear it wants to onshore and wants to exit actually from exports and being reliant uh, on other markets. I think people have realized what that would mean around the world. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, we look into the technology issue. The semiconductors is one thing. What many people don't understand is that actually semiconductor is virtually in everything. Uh, so when we build a big plant here, as I do, or if we have uh, uh, basically to deal with the digital wonderland of China, the digital wonderland of China is built on uh, mostly American and Dutch and European hardware. Uh, so there will be an impact that we find very difficult to put a, 
put a grip on it. So uh, a change in the White House, I don't think this is going to change uh, the kind of technology war that you might call it. And then, of course, finance. That's the real worry here in Beijing, that uh, the government sees the dollar as a weapon. As Connolly, Nixon's uh, Treasury Secretary said, you know, the dollar is my currency, but your problem. This is exactly how Beijing sees it. Uh, and of course, looking into uh, the fact that uh, Chinese banks might go down the same road like Russian banks did, the SWIFT and so on and so on. And of course, the last point uh, is uh, the, the human factor uh, of R&D exchange of people. So for us in business here, it's going to be definitely uh, very difficult. Uh, US and China with ease cross red lines, they see no exit ramp. So for us, actually, I guess in Europe, for if, if, if I put myself in, in uh, decision-making shoes there, uh, it means that European business really would like to see the European Commission and the member states stepping up to the plate in order to frankly do industrial policy, in order to get our industry there uh, where uh, it, it should be. It reminds me a little bit of the United States at the Sputnik moment, um, where basically a lot of money came out and then they put the man on the moon in 69 and in the course of this, the internet was invented. We need something uh, similar. So in a way, maybe China helps us in order to get our act together and reform ourselves. Because frankly, having lived here in this country for 30 years, I don't see how we really managed to change China. Thank you very much. Before we come back to the Sputnik moment, Ryan, I'd, I would just like to ask you about decoupling. How real uh, is the, the risk that we'll see decoupling between China and the US? Well, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I, I am neither uh, in Beijing nor in business. So I think that I'm, of the two of us, I'm the least qualified to comment on this, but I will offer uh, something that maybe uh, that can be improved upon by Jorge, which is that there is a limit to how far I think decoupling will go. Uh, I think that there already has been decoupling for some time uh, in low end uh, manufacturing. We, this preceded President Trump and it will succeed President Trump. Um, you know, the, the, the cost advantages to producing low end goods in China have eroded over time. So if, if that's the question, then I think that there will be a uh, drift away from, from China. But, you know, a lot of the decoupling narrative is built upon anecdotes. And you can find anecdotes to validate either argument, that there, there is uh, decoupling underway or that American and international businesses are continuing to invest in China. I don't think that I have yet seen any empirical evidence to suggest that there is a hard decoupling that is underway and that is on an accelerating and inexorable path. Um, I think that it's a very mixed picture. And uh, the only way to really get clarity on the picture is to go sector by sector and, and to look at uh, what's actually happening. So um, I very much agree with the comment that the technology war will continue, uh, irrespective of, of the outcome of the next presidential election. I think that's really at the core of, of competition between the United States and China, and that's not going to change. Uh, but the, the tools and the intensity, the tools used and the intensity around that war uh, uh, may, may shift depending upon the outcome of the election. Your critical, what would you like European politicians to do? We've heard in an earlier sec, um, session that even um, the much wanted um, com uh, comprehensive agreement about investment mightn't be a panacea. You've spoken of promise fatigue. Uh, it's not as if European politicians haven't tried to, to, to engage with China. What are the, the concrete steps um, you're, you're hoping for? What, what needs to be achieved? Well, I guess that um, uh, it's a sense of realism. It's just the fact that uh, China is very difficult, if not impossible, to be moved. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a communist society. You know, this might come as a surprise to many people. And China has a very clear tinted glasses. And that means the West goes down, the East is rising. And whatever is between doesn't matter. So in a way, to, to make China act in our direction is going to be really difficult. The only thing we can really influence is ourselves. Um, and sometimes uh, China helps us. I mean, look at uh, what Thomas Bagger said before, how China has uh, in the last six months united Europe in many ways. Um, and have you heard about 17 plus one recently? Uh, I don't think so, given how the Poles and the Czechs think about China. So in a way, China, in a way, again, the Sputnik model, China might be the, the driver for us to actually get going 
and, and decide uh, to compete, but also certainly uh, cooperate, but not to be uh, uh, naive enough to believe that uh, we are comrades in arms anywhere. Uh, we are rivals and the Chinese see this very clearly. Uh, you know, this is again a, a system built on uh, communistic ideas. Uh, you know, the, this system will win over capitalism. And this is exactly what you read in Chosha and other newspapers here. Um, uh, it's, it's clear that there's a, there's a clear convincing thought in the leadership of China that, uh, again, China will come out the better. Uh, and frankly, in many ways, they couldn't care less that they have so many opponents created over the last six months. Uh, that's a real problem. I think that's a loss of reality given the propaganda situation here. Um, so anyhow, it's, it's the way it is. Europe can only uh, work on its own toolbox. They start investment uh, screening. They look into subsidies. Um, they should uh, look into IPIs, safeguarding European business and third markets, but always under the premise not to turn this into a protectionist uh, toolbox, but in a way making sure that the uh, Chinese players that naturally should be welcome. We want China to invest in Europe, but they play according to our rules and not the rules that uh, I have to face here every day. Thank you very much, Ryan. I, I see you keep nodding. I don't know whether you want to add anything um, specifically to that. And I would also like to, um, to, uh, you to expand on something you said earlier, because you said there is potential for a cooperation in certain areas, you know, interest driven. I don't know whether it's too early to be specific, but I'd be interested what you were uh, referring to precisely. Well, well, thank you, Silke. This is a, a great conversation. And, and um, I very much agree that uh, the United States, China, and Europe, there is a inherent built-in rivalry. And it's incumbent upon us uh, to show that our system is the most innovative, dynamic, and most capable of addressing social challenges and, and uh, enabling human progress. Um, I, d I don't think that there is... Uh, a, any you know rose tinted view that we're going to change China uh, at least that I've encountered uh, in Washington these days, uh, but at the same time I, I don't think that there should be uh, any defeatist thinking that it's impossible to uh, affect the uh, incentives and disincentives of China. I mean countries ultimately over the medium to long term are guided by identification of their interest and pursuit of their interest, and it's our job to uh, try to to influence that where we can. And this, I guess, leads to the, the question that, that you raised, uh, where are uh, areas where there is scope for greater transatlantic coordination or cooperation on China? I must admit at the outset that, uh, that my goal was not to, uh, uh, you know, have the hubris to provide a solution or, or answer to that question, but really to try to just stimulate a discussion amongst us uh, so that it can carry forward and, and gain momentum, hopefully between now and January and, and beyond. But I'll, in, in the spirit of trying to, to not dodge your question and, and, and be constructive, I will offer a, a few ideas for, for your and others to, to react to. Uh, I think that uh, it, it may be possible to work together on things like uh, pushing China on government procurement and entry to the government procurement agreement. Uh, there may be scope to deal with uh, industrial subsidies, overcapacity, uh, tech transfer issues, um, digital trade, uh, is an important area. I think that the, the, the EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement uh, provides uh, a starting point for us to have a serious discussion about whether or not there is uh, space for us to find commonality of purpose there. Uh, digital standards, uh, particularly for 5G build out. Um, climate, biosafety, um, dealing with, uh, as was discussed in the last panel, uh, moving China from its angry corner on uh, development and, and deployment of vaccines for COVID-19 to becoming part of the team, uh, I think is a noble cause and, uh, and would be a worthwhile use of our, our time and energy. But those are just a, a few initial ideas to, you know, to try to spur the conversation. Jörg Wittgott, would you like to comment on these? Are they, do they make sense to you, those areas? Yeah, I mean, uh, China only reacts uh, to uh, 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 situations of strength on the other side. It's, in a way, it's, uh, uh, we are playing all uh, uh, football, but uh, China plays American football. <laughs> uh, it's always aligned, always pushing, and uh, has these uh, big uh, uh, gears uh, all over the place, whereas Europeans tend to play uh, uh, soccer. 
Uh, that means individual strengths and, you know, looking good at this kind of stuff. And we have to be aware that somehow we have to deal with a different opponent. But the point it is, I mean, we have to find common ground somewhere how to play a game together. But we should not be naive that they're going to change voluntarily. We have to be strong. And I really agree with Ryan and, and also with uh, people like Thomas before that actually, I guess, the new administration would leave to a point uh, that we find more common ground. You might call it the OECD plus, uh, plus might be India, I don't know. But uh, at the same time, uh, we should not uh, uh, corner China, encircle China or contain China, it's impossible. Uh, it does, it's not in everybody's uh, interest. Uh, uh, but we have to see that uh, uh, we, we, we stay in touch, uh, but from a more, put it, put it this way, from a more stronger position than uh, we had in the past. Thank you very much. I would like to turn uh, to some questions from um, the listeners. We've got one from Sam Gale, um, which is directed to, to Ryan, I presume. Can and will Biden seek to rebuild the US-China climate cooperation relationship? And is there a role for Europe here? This morning we saw that there is um, quite some optimism on, on that topic. Um, can you fill us in? What is the U.S. view? What is your view? Well, uh, my, my sense, thank you for the question. My sense is that uh, climate would very much return to the fore of uh, American priorities. Uh, anyone who's watching the American news right now know that uh, the western part of the United States is literally on fire. Uh, I'm a native of Washington State, so I'm particularly uh, interested in, in this story. But it, it, uh, it has drawn attention and focus in the presidential election campaign right now to climate change. And, uh, and I think Joe Biden has been very clear and very consistent in his view that climate change is a ex existential threat to the United States. Uh, and it's not something that can be shelved and dealt with later. It needs to be uh, dealt with with urgency and immediacy. And there's no path to dealing seriously with climate change unless China is prodded to move in uh, the same direction as Europe and the United States. So absolutely, 100% uh, my view is that uh, the climate would uh, return to, uh, you know, the first page of the U.S.-China relationship. Um, but I, I, I think that it's also worth bearing in mind that climate won't eclipse every other issue in the U.S.-China relationship. Some of my conservative friends in the United States are concerned that uh, the that, uh, a Biden administration would become singularly focused on climate change at the expense of all other competitive elements of the relationship. I think that there is uh, a belief and a faith and a confidence that it's possible to have a mature enough relationship to deal with both competitive issues as well as climate simultaneously. Thank you very much. Um, Shi Wei Shi would like to know from Jürgen Wood is something that is related to the situation in China um, on the ground. She's asking, why does um, the CCP involve, get, interfere so much uh, with business in China? Is there a fear behind this that private business will get rid of the control of the state um, because uh, they channel m money abroad? Um, what's your take on this? Well, I, I always put it, uh, given the fact that actually I'm married to a Russian that uh, China has, or particularly Xi Jinping, has uh, three Russian traumas. One is... Uh, the criticism of Khrushchev to Mao Zedong, uh, he makes it very clear there's no such a thing of criticizing Mao. This was the beginning of uh, the end of the Communist Party, so he says. Then, of course, Gorbachev, the kind of uh, opening up without control uh, uh, that led to the 91 implosion. And then, to your point, uh, of course, the Yeltsin years, uh, where there was absolute uh, uh, wild west in Russia, and uh, the point that actually this uh, privatization of state-owned enterprises led to the richness of oligarchs like Beresovsky, Rusinski, and others that then challenged or even ran the president's uh, election campaign in 1996, uh, something that Xi Jinping certainly doesn't want to have. He wants the party solely control. He doesn't want to have rich people that actually are opinionated or actually challenging the party or finance that. And you can see with the fate of Jack Ma that, uh, you know, he was pretty much pushed out because he was bigger than life uh, to the president. He felt threatened. Uh, so he likes more the kinds of Robin Ma, Tencent chairman, who basically gets uh, a lot of things done, makes money, but uh, stays out politically. So it's all about control. The Communist Party is all about control. 
Thank you very much for that vivid description. We've got another question from Rainer Cordes, uh, who would like us to think the unthinkable because he thinks that's crucial when you, when you actually make scenarios. Ryan, would you rule out the possibility of a friendship between a Trump USA and China led by Xi after the elections? And his argument is both share some traits, um, therefore such an alignment uh, could be thought of, according to him, and wouldn't that make the world um, a bit of a more dangerous place? Well, I mean, it's a very creative question. Uh, I, I agree with the premise that anything is possible and we shouldn't uh, have blinders on to avoid any, any future scenario. Uh, I also agree with uh, the underlying premise that, that there are uh, personality traits that both uh, Donald Trump and Xi Jinping share. Uh, both are very committed to the idea of projecting strength. Uh, both lean heavily upon nationalism. And, and both have a certain paranoia or insecurity uh, to domestic uh, uh, challenges. Um, I, I, I guess I'm a little bit less anxious than maybe if I interpret the question correctly that the Donald Trump and Xi Jinping will, you know, enter some bat cave and come up with some grand strategy for, for dominating the world together. I just, I think that there are so many constraints in the American political system to that scenario playing out. Uh, one of which is public opinion in the United States. You know, 73% of Americans right now have a unfavorable view of China. No matter who wins the presidential election, that will, that will be a factor in, in how any administration approaches China. Um, but I think there also would be, you know, a lot of congressional challenges to, to any such approach. So uh, of all the things that keep me up at night, um, I don't think that that scenario will be one of them. Thank you very much. We've got a question for Jörg Rutke from Patrick Hess. Uh, since you mentioned SWIFT and Russian banks, um, do you think that the U.S. will use the nuclear option um, i.e. cutting um, Hong Kong and the Chinese mainland banks off the uh, U.S. startup via SWIFT? Well, I'm, I guess that uh, the U.S. will make a point of taking a couple of uh, Chinese banks out uh, uh, after they found them sort of in violation in, in uh, sanctions uh, towards whatever. Um, uh, but you have to keep in mind that I'm sure the U.S. will not go for the big five that have 50% of Chinese banking assets, uh, but on one of these 3,500 other banks that share the other 50%. So it's a warning shot, but it's not going to be uh, sort of encircling China or taking China's banking system out. But I guess also interesting for us Europeans is if you look into Russia, um, it's 100% trade in US dollars uh, 15 years ago, and now it's only 50%. Uh, Russia moves in its trade to the euro. That might also be very interesting to see if China moves away from the dollar into the euro, what it does to our currency, the kind of appreciation factor. You have to sort of think about this. So in a way, I guess SWIFT, well, China is building up its own SWIFT, but of course it's the comparison of a Xiaoli and a Mercedes-Benz. So uh, that's gonna take a while. Uh, and China has made it very clear, in particular, uh, Fang Xinghai, who used to be Xi Jinping's advisor, that uh, he's not only worried about this uh, scenario, but also that he's trying to get his system to prepare for that. It just shows you where they are already. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to add another question on banking uh, by Robin Niblett. Um, he's referring to Ryan's point uh, about um, sector by sector um, decoupling. And he mentions the fact that it's interesting to see that big US banks are expanding and being welcomed into um, the opening up of the Chinese financial services de uh, delivery. Um, he doesn't say who he wants to address the question to. Any of you, do you have any thoughts on that? It's a pretty interesting development. Maybe being on the ground at start, uh, you know, I mean, there's always this kind of uh, engagement on foreign banks and foreign finance and so forth. Uh, but just keep in mind, uh, we have a solid 1.7% of market share, all the foreigners together. Uh, and it's, it's getting smaller and smaller. Uh, that's a typical thing in China. They always let you go enter uh, the market when they have their own champions uh, 
uh, and uh, basically I don't have to fear. I mean, for us, again, even this 1.7% for the Morgan Stanley's, the Goldman Sachs of this world is super important. Uh, uh, we, we try to open it up more, uh, but we have to be re realistic uh, when it comes to the financial sector. We are niche players at best. And I'm jumping around because I'm sort of following uh, the viewers' questions. We've got one for Ryan on Taiwan. Where do you see Taiwan's future under Biden presidency? It's something we haven't touched upon at all. It, it's a great question. Um, I think that, broadly speaking, the framework for the U.S. approach to Taiwan is pretty well established. It's been pretty well established for 40 years. Uh, and it's guided by uh, America's interest in what it wants to see happen in Taiwan. It wants to see a vibrant, um, democratic Taiwan that flourishes, that, uh, that has economic strength, and that feels secure and uh, enjoys dignity and respect on the world stage. So that overall sort of framework and identification of interest on Taiwan, I don't think will be altered by the outcome of the U.S. election. Uh, to the extent that there is uh, any shift in approach, um, I think that there would be uh, an effort to re redevelop uh, a a positive agenda with Taiwan that uh, is exclusive of China. Uh, there are ample areas where the United States and Taiwan have aligned interest and uh, can work together, whether it's on cancer research or or clean technologies or um, strengthening public health capacity in, in various parts of the world. So I think that there would be an effort to invigorate uh, those parts of the relationship that haven't um, been nourished as much in recent years. I think that there also would be an effort to bring the economic dimension of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship up a little closer to par uh, with the level of intensity around the security relationship between the United States and Taiwan. And then uh, relatedly, I think that there would be a desire to resume uh, direct communication between Washington and Beijing on cross-strait issues, um, simply to ensure that Beijing hears authoritatively, clearly, and directly, unambiguously, the strength of our concerns, where we have priorities uh, as it relates to, to cross-strait issues. Um, and that would, you know, shrink space for miscalculation and uh, reduce reliance upon military signaling uh, to register displeasure. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's time to wrap up. I've already seen someone else uh, who'd like to come in. We've got plenty of interesting questions. I'm, I'm really very sorry that we can't deal with them all. Um, I would like to thank uh, Jörg Wutke in China. It's late, very late by now. And Ryan, you've got the day ahead of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for giving us a, a transatlantic um, perspective. And if there is this one final remark, is there is no clear picture emerging. I think we've got tough times ahead. It's something we knew before this discussion, but you've both confirmed um, that uh, the ship uh, will be rocked in the uh, next few uh, months and maybe even years to come. So thank you for, for your attention. And I'm handing over to Mika for the next session. Thank you um, again also Jörg and Ryan and thank you um, for the wonderful moderation. I would like to invite my colleague now Lucrezia Pogetti for the final session of today which will be indeed about deepening and broadening the perspective once more uh, and talk to a set of wonderful parliamentarians from across Europe on the China um, picture and the China questions that we all face and uh, the floor is yours Lucrezia for that final session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miko, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Welcome to our concluding session for today. Uh, I can see one of our speakers already online, uh, but I hope everyone was able to join us in the meantime. Um, and indeed, uh, welcome to both our physical audience here at Merix and welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Um, China is increasingly discussed in national debates across Europe, so we thought we would conclude with the grand finale uh, talking about how China is viewed uh, in European capitals, expanding indeed our horizons uh, and get out of the Berlin or the uh, Brussels bubble perhaps. Um, so we are going to uh, take stock of how views about China have evolved uh, over the past year or two. Uh, in order to understand whether a common understanding on China might indeed uh, be emerging uh, across Europe. 
And in order to do that, uh, we have a fantastic set of very distinguished panelists joining us uh, from Italy. We have Lia Quartapelle. Um, she's an MP uh, for the Italian Parliament uh, for the Democratic Party. She also sits on the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you to you, Lucrezia. From uh, Sweden, uh, we have uh, Ulf Christasson. He is the main uh, leader of the opposition uh, as the leader of the moderate party. Thank you as well for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Then from Warsaw, we are going to hear from uh, Radoslav Sikorski. Um, he barely needs an introduction. He's former foreign minister and defense minister of Poland, currently seats uh, in the European uh, Parliament as part of the European uh, People's Group. And thank you as well uh, for joining us uh, today. Um, and last but not least, uh, we were not able to have uh, Tom Tugendhat from the UK joining us live, uh, but he was still able to at least um, send us an answer, send us a short statement that we're going to hear from him as well, so that we get a UK perspective. Um, in these interesting times on China, we find that it's still important to include uh, a British perspective on what's going on, especially considering how interesting the debate about China is in, frankly, all these countries that we're going uh, to cover today. Um, so we are going to hear from all these uh, speakers. They are going to give us a short, roughly seven minute long input. Uh, I'm not sure we will have time for a Q&A. We'll see how we will be doing uh, on time. It's a very short session, unfortunately, but I'm sure there will be plenty of interesting input from them. So let me start right away asking uh, Lia Quartapelle to join us. And let me briefly introduce um, how things have been shifting in Italy. It's quite interesting. Uh, just a year and a half ago, the Italian government, uh, the previous coalition of the Italian government, as you all know, was joining uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative by formally signing a memorandum of understanding. Now we find ourselves in a very different situation and we saw uh, different developments uh, coming out of the Italian government, for example, on Hong Kong or 5G. Um, so, uh, Ms. Quartapelle, could you help us make sense of these shifts that we've been witnessing in the Italian debate on China? How have views about China evolved and how do you motivate that change? Well, uh, there are, uh, I would say that there have been two uh, major shifts. Uh, one happened last year, as you rightly suggested, when Italy started with the new coalition government. Uh, the first sign that we gave as a parliament was to approve a resolution on Hong Kong. Uh, it, was a unanim uh, it was voted unanimously by the entire parliament. Uh, and it was a resolution that condemned uh, what was happening in Hong Kong, supported the requests of the opposition, especially the request for uh, an, inquiry, an independent inquiry into police br brutality. Uh, so we really wanted to give a sign that, uh, especially on China, we were going back to the traditional way of uh, relationship with the country after the previous government uh, signed the Belt and Road Initiative which of course was a strong political statement of closeness to, to Beijing rather than closeness to the European Union. With that resolution, we wanted to say that something different has happened. Um, however, then COVID came and Italy, at least in the public opinion, there was a major shift uh, he, besides Lucrezia, I don't know how many Italians are following us, but uh, the first days of the pandemic in Italy were um, a shifting momentum for the country and for the public opinion towards China. Uh, we were looking for face masks, we were looking for help, and China exploited the situation very cunningly uh, using uh, instruments of soft diplomacy, uh, sending us face masks, doctors, medicines when it was first needed. And while we heard uh, that uh, uh, European countries were blocking um, uh, 
deliveries of, of uh, DPIs to Italy because they were nationalized by France or Germany, we were hearing that planes were on their way from China with much needed DPIs for doctors and for, for nurses. No matter that uh, it was the, the, the quantity of DPIs coming from China was very little compared to the needs, uh, no matter that if China had uh, warned the world before of coronavirus, Italy wouldn't have been in such a situation. What mattered then at the time of uh, incredible emergency for the country was that China was there and France and Germany were stopping uh, essential deliveries of, of DPIs. Uh, and this uh, mood of the country was uh, pictured very clearly in a poll taken a few weeks after the beginning of the epidemics when it was recorded that the country with which 43% of Italians uh, polled uh, felt closer was China. Uh, the first country that they said they felt closer to their heart was China. It wasn't the United States, it wasn't any other European country, but it was China. And in the same poll, um, the country that uh, people felt a new enemy, uh, the number one new enemy, was actually Germany, with 35% of the respondents saying that the new enemy was Germany. So China really exploited that moment uh, to do uh, soft skill diplomacy uh, on, on a very sensitive issue and trying to cancel uh, what had happened with the pandemic. After the, the first weeks of the pandemic, we had a very interesting report of the Com Parliamentary Committee of Oversight on Secret Service, which underlined to what extent Italy was subject to a wide campaign of misinformation orchestrated by China, especially on the virus, with specific instances. So not only the mood and the, the, the open diplomacy of China was in, in that direction, but we were also targeted by a very sophisticated and very widespread campaign using uh, digital technology. This was the state until a couple of days ago. I don't know to what extent uh, the people that will intervene after me will, will touch on this, but two days ago um, in Italy uh, was published this part of a, of a world of a, of a world um, inquiry by um, uh, 10 journalists on a list of people that uh, are under scrutiny uh, by uh, uh, private company by China, which is linked to uh, to the, the Ministry of to the Security Services of, of Beijing, uh, and uh, it results that 4,000 people in Italy are under observation using artificial intelligence, and this is another turning point in the history of, in the recent history of relationship between Italy and China, uh, because we have heard for the first time uh, ministers of the government be very clear that the issue here with China, especially with respect to data protection and the circulation of data, uh, it, they say that it is a matter of national security, it's not anymore a matter of commercial interests. And so again, uh, the situation is shifting here. And I think in Italy, there is um, the awareness that uh, uh, you cannot treat China any longer uh, as only a commercial partner. You cannot do the Belt and Road Initiative as a, as a sign of goodwill for, to, to increase trade ties, but you really have to treat it with a lot of attention, because otherwise you become subject to campaigns of misinformation and uh, in any way we are under observation by security services of China. Thank you very much. Perfectly on time as well. Um, we are going to move right away to uh, Sweden and hear from Ulf Christensen. Um, very, very curious, because obviously Sweden is a country that we've all been watching quite closely, because I think <laughs> more than other European countries, it's been faced with quite some challenges for a bit of a longer time in its relations with China. And Sweden is also one of the few countries 
uh, that has published a China strategy, uh, if I remember correctly, last year. So same question for you, Mr. Christensen. How do you see the debate in China evolving in Sweden? Uh, where do we stand? Thank you so much. Uh, quite an interesting question. Um, let me first say it's really a privilege to take part in this conference with so many well-known China experts uh, to discuss one of what I think is the very most important foreign, foreign policy fields of today. But let me start off with a few words on a more general Swedish approach to foreign affairs and globalization. I think we have a broad consensus in Sweden on the importance of free trade and how it benefits our economy, our society. We are since long a trading nation, as you know. We have traded with China for over a century. Our very first bilateral treaty was actually signed in 1847. And the well-known telecom giant Ericsson has been in China since late 1800s. In addition to our openness to trade, uh, there has been a strong adherence to multilateral organizations and international law in Sweden. Both are obviously of strategic importance for a pretty small country like Sweden. And despite our proclaimed non-alignment during the Cold War, Swedish society has an inherent concern about the threats posed by authoritarian states, our geographical proximity to Russia, and of course the modern history of our neighboring countries around the Baltic Sea have both led us to this very sound skepticism towards that kind of regimes. So it gets more and more obvious how Beijing's activities are leading to a weakening of the rules-based system for international trade and multilateral cooperation and the blatant disregard of international law as well as human rights are of course very troublesome for Sweden. The security threat posed by Beijing against its neighboring region and the rest of the world has indeed been noticed also in Stockholm. Russian Chinese joint military exercises in the Baltic Sea has not been benefited uh, has not benefited the image of Beijing either, of course. This week, we all got news about the Zhenhua data leak. Uh, the Chinese company compiled personal information about officials around the world, including, of course, myself. Uh, we knew they did, but now it's revealed. All of this might help explain the results from a Pew Research report last year on how people around the world perceive China. Sweden actually came second only to Japan when ranking in populations with the most negative views. 70% of Swedes in the survey indicated an unfavorable opinion about China. I think a number of dramatic events in recent years ends up in a much more pessimistic view on what's happening in China compared to perhaps early 2000s. Allow me to just briefly focus on three specific cases. First, the Chinese abduction and imprisonment of the Swedish citizen Guay Minhai, a publisher, as you know, critical of Beijing's ruling elite. In 2015, Guay Minhai was illegally taken by Chinese authorities while on vacation in, Th in Thailand. A couple of months later, he suddenly appeared on Chinese television, state television, with a forced confession. The fate of Guay Minhai has seriously damaged our bilateral relations with China. It has also led, actually, to important questions about our government's handling of this unique kidnapping of a Swedish citizen. Secondly, this wolf warrior diplomacy conducted by Chinese ambassadors in European capital, capitals, I think, has backfired. The behavior and very undiplomatic remarks by Beijing's ambassador to Sweden has been an important factor, actually, in explaining the rapid shift in Swedish public opinion. 
the most aggravating examples concern the embassy's public statements about Swedish scholars, Swedish journalists, and policymakers. Well, against anyone actually criticizing criticizing current activities of the Chinese Communist Party. Most recently, of course, uh, in Hong Kong matters and the interference in the Taiwan elections. Some time ago, actually, the embassy went to fierce attack uh, on its uh, own website against a very young Swedish scholar in his 20s who had written an essay on Chinese attempts to influence the diaspora in Sweden. As a party leader, I have received complaints from the Chinese em embassy in Stockholm asking me to take action against fellow member of parliament uh, for their statements uh, on China. Another example was the embassy's reaction to the decision by Swedish Penn to award Gui Minhai with its annual prize and their following attack against our Minister of Culture for participating in the ceremony, threatening to ban her from entering the country. Of course, she did attend, as did I. A third case explaining our shift in attitudes relates to the Swedish approach to trade policy. Chinese state intervention in the economy leads to important challenges for us on level playing fields as well as on security. There is no reciprocity to talk about. European companies face tough challenges in China. At the same time, we see aggressive acquisitions over here. An important wake-up call in the Swedish debate was the Chinese acquisition of three Swedish high-tech semiconductor companies two years ago, leading to demands to put in place a system of investment screening. That is now underway. The urgency has, of course, been highlighted by the corona crisis. And finally, one thing is clear in our current approach to China. There is no more naivety in the Swedish discussion on China. And we realize that we need to step up our efforts to safeguard norms and standards internationally as well as at home. We think that a common European approach and a strong transatlantic bond are therefore the two vital parts of this emerging Swedish China strategy that needs to be developed and even more implemented. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we already start hearing a few common themes here. It's quite interesting how just a couple of years ago, we were mainly discussing China as an economic actor. We still do, but increasingly, uh, we have to face the political challenges as well and figure out our way uh, to deal with it. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go first to uh, Poland, um, Mr. Sikorski. Um, Poland is also uh, obviously quite interesting as a member of uh, also the 17 plus one framework for cooperation with China. It's been causing a format that has been causing quite some concern in Brussels, for example, for a few years. But now uh, things seem to have shifted uh, quite a bit in the country. Uh, and for example, we see some of the toughest positions coming out of Poland and other um, Central and Eastern European countries on issues like 5G. So again, um, same question to you. Can you help us maybe summarize how views about China has changed, has been evolving in Poland, and uh, what has uh, motivated that change? Thank you. Um, I'm actually physically in Brussels right now, um, which is just as well, because on this issue, I'm wearing two hats. Um, I, I will tell you what Poland generally thinks about it, but I'm also the um, author of the uh, draft EPP strategy on China, which uh, if adopted, which it hasn't yet been, um, might also be an input into Brussels policy towards China. Let me start by just quoting from Ursula von der Leyen's um, statement um, in her State of the Union today, which I think is good. The relationship between the European Union and China is simultaneously one of the most strategically important and the most challenging we have. From the outset, I have said that China is a negotiating partner, an economic competitor, and a systemic rival. So we must always uh, call on 
uh, call out human rights abuses and whenever and wherever they occur, being it uh, in Hong Kong or with the Uyghurs. Um, and um, uh, there is also uh, uh, the announcement that she will support a European Magnitsky Act. Uh, the Commission will come forward with a proposal so that we have an instrument of uh, imposing pers personal sanctions on the authors of abuses. And, and this unites certainly the Polish and the European perspective. You know, we are a country of solidarity, and as European Union, we are committed to human rights. Um, and what goes on in Xinjiang and in Hong Kong is, is cruel beyond belief. I personally believe that, that what uh, the Chinese authorities have decided to do in Hong Kong is also misguided, because by clamping down on Hong Kong, they've taken the rug un from underneath those people in Taiwan, for example, the, the old Kuomintang, who um, were in favor of a one China policy and who envisaged perhaps some kind of peaceful uh, reunification uh, sometime in the future under the um, uh, one country, two systems uh, doctrine, which I think uh, the events of Hong in Hong Kong have now made it completely uh, non-credible, which I think is a mistake because it narrows China's options uh, to a military solution on Taiwan, which would be terrible for Taiwan, but, but also, I believe, for China and for, for the world as a whole. Um, uh, in Poland, we do have a slightly different view of China than, uh, than Western Europe, uh, because uh, Poland was not a colonial power. In the 19th century, we were victims of colonialism, just as China was, and actually uh, victims of um, some of this, uh, well, one particular uh, uh, power. Um, uh, Poland was under partitions by uh, Russia, uh, and Russia was also party to some of the unequal treaties with China. And indeed, the Chinese remembered that Outer Manchuria with uh, Vladivostok um, uh, was one of those treaties. I think it was the Treaty of Beijing of 1850 or 70, I forget now. Um, but so, so there is this feeling that uh, 19th century was a bad time for us and for them, and, and that creates a little bit of a common feeling. Also, not everybody knows that there was a peculiar relationship between Poland and China uh, under communism. Um, in the 60s uh, and early 70s, uh, there were several rounds of secret negotiations between the United States and China in Warsaw, in communist Poland, which is how the trip, uh, the Nixon and China trip was, was uh, prepared. And there are legends, at least, that the Chinese intervened with the Soviets in 1956 against the hung Hungary-style style, um, uh, intervention uh, in Poland. Um, so what colors everything for Poland is the fact that we have a neighbor in common, Poland and China, which is the Russian Federation, uh, and that Poland still sees um, as a threat to its, um, to its security. Uh, and that colors our relationship um, with China, with the United States, because we feel vulnerable and we feel that Europe is not up to the task of protecting us, therefore we need the United States, therefore we go along with the United States on things like 5G and others. On 16 plus 1, which you mentioned, I took part in the, uh, in the early meetings. Um, uh, remember that most uh, Central European countries are the size of one Chinese city. And so when we have a meeting in uh, Warsaw, for example, five years ago, with the Prime Minister of China, there is a certain logistical logic to it. I mean, a small country in Central Europe can't hope 
to attract a, a visit by the uh, Prime Minister of China. Whereas if they deal with us on a regional basis, it's, you know, they, they, can, they can state their interests. That's part of the, uh, of the reason. And the other part of the reason is that Western Europeans have their long-standing commercial relationships with China. Huge investments both ways and uh, intimate uh, industrial relationships. And they are not letting us, Central Europeans, into those relationships. So Central Europe is trying to get something going um, to balance it. I don't think much has yet come of it, uh, no, no will much, actually. Um, I, each time I've looked at, what, you know, at investments and the, what's actually going on, it's not really much. It's a shorthand. It's a, uh, and I agree that it should be done within the European framework and, um, <clears throat> and perhaps should be phased out on one condition, that the rest of the European Union starts abiding by the Lisbon Treaty and conducting policy towards China in common, <laughs> of which I see no sign. Um, uh, we've pledged ourselves to agree joint policy in the European Council, in the Council on Foreign Affairs, and then allow the High Rep and the President of the Council to carry it out. But of course, that's not the reality. Um, uh, main um, member states uh, uh, freelance in parallel with China, uh, which I, th I think is, is uh, ineffective because by comparison with China, they really are all small countries. Um, so I would be strongly in favor of joint positions provided everybody uh, uh, loyally supports the agreed policy. Um, it's already been said, Ulf has said that of course we've noticed the, uh, we are no longer naive about uh, uh, China's attitudes and policies, industrial policies, technological policies and so on. Let, let's face it, 20, 30 years ago, we made a bet that China, uh, if treated as a market economy, might liberalize, at least in the economic sphere. And we have lost that bet. The Chinese took advantage of uh, liberal uh, policies various, in various areas to build themselves up. Uh, the Americans, um, went on a 10-year detour with their war on terrorism, took the eye off the ball, and, and we are where we are. Uh, I, I will need to see... Because I would really love to also have a final statement, so I will just uh, maybe conclude briefly, if you can. Sure. Well, look, um, I think we should um, collaborate with them where we can, um, compete, where it's, where, 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 where it's necessary and confront uh, if it's obligatory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. I really do hope to have a few more very brief sharp statements from you at the end. But before we do that, uh, we're going to hear um, a recording from Tom Tugendhat. Uh, he's a member of the UK Parliament as a Conservative uh, and, as you know, also head of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, um, the UK itself, very interesting case study of a country that went from a golden era of relations with China uh, to something slightly different, a bit of a rethink, uh, and uh, we are going to hear from him also with his experience uh, establishing a China research group to inject, as they say, fresh thinking into uh, the UK's China policy. Hello. Over the last few years, the relationship between the United Kingdom and China has changed. The golden era that marked out George Osborne and David Cameron's uh, approach to Beijing has really gone into a very, very cold freezer. And this is for several reasons. The most obvious indicator of it, of course, was the Huawei decision and the vote in Parliament that really unnerved the government here. But actually, the triggers for this change are much deeper. And they're not to do with technology. They're to do with domination. China's decision to change the way 
it approaches the international order has been something that has really marked out uh, a very different world. Under President Xi, under General Secretary Xi, we've seen China going from growing within a rules-based system, partnering in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and being part of a, a WTO and environmental system that looks for cooperation into one that is really much more marked by a form of uh, nationalism, Leninism, and domination. And we see this with things like the Hanbantota port in Sri Lanka, with the investments in places like Zambia, uh, where the domination of the uh, mining industry has become such a, a subject of concern. And we're seeing it, of course, as well in the way that the Belt and Road system is structured. Now, in more recent months, we've seen an even more dramatic change. With the conflict that we're seeing growing on the Indian border, as Chinese troops have pushed out from their uh, existing positions. But all of these are external factors. Internally, we're also seeing a real change in China. The crackdown on the democracy movement in Hong Kong is extremely worrying. The removal of freedoms and, of course, the national security bill that we've seen applied are really, really deeply concerning. And then, of course, in Western China, we see something even worse. The arrest, the detention, and indeed, in some cases, uh, the deaths of many Uyghur Muslims, the forced sterilization of women, and the repression that we're seeing in Xinjiang is really of a scale that we haven't seen since the 1930s. Now, I hope very much, and we don't expect it to go in the direction that did. But still, what we're seeing is a very, very different China. We're seeing a China in which uh, the forms of domination by the Chinese Communist Party and uh, by the ethnic Han has really changed the way that the country is governed. All of these have made for a very different relationship between the United Kingdom and China. And all of these make the future much harder to see as cooperative. Now, this is a shame, of course, but it also means that we need to think very hard here in the United Kingdom, but also in amongst our allies about how we deal with this changing world and how we shape ourselves. For me, this means that we need to invest very much more in alliances. And some of these allies are very clear. I mean, Japan and India are two obvious ones, Australia, the United States, of course. But actually, we need to look as well at how we build up a different uh, global cooperative system to make sure that the partnership that we believe matters, the network of interlocking economies and interlocking nations, uh, supporting everything from commerce to environmental uh, protection, actually do defend the system that we know matters. Now that's difficult. It's difficult for several reasons, but most immediately it's difficult because various forms of Chinese uh, overseas policy from technology uh, and influence are changing the way that many of these countries act. Some of the first things that roll out into a lot of economies are not uh, Chinese trade contracts, but actually Chinese tech contracts. If you look at the rollout of Alipay and WeChat into a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, you see that the economic dependence, the economic dependence of many on Beijing is actually through the soft incremental increase in uh, Chinese influence rather than through a trade deal or a debt diplomacy. Now, this is again a challenge because much of the influence that the West has been able to leverage is through the international uh, reserve currency of the dollar and through uh, the SWIFT system of global banking. And as that is replaced by uh, electronic payment systems and perhaps even soon an e renminbi, we look like we're going to see a, a very different kind of uh, relationship between uh, nation states and Beijing. Now, where does this go? Well, that's still too early to tell. But if we are to defend uh, the international system that we have grown up with, then it needs much more involvement by countries that have formally, in many ways, stood aside. 
and it needs a much more active involvement in countries that are not traditionally uh, seen as its uh, key uh, pillars. And that means working with countries that have sometimes uh, not always been the most active in it. Countries like Indonesia, South Korea, that have done an awful lot to reform themselves internally, but have not always played quite the same role externally. Now, I think that one other element here is to look at how the European Union and European member states change their relationship. Countries like Germany uh, and indeed France are beginning to move on this. Countries like Italy are still less so. And so the European position is still quite complicated. But seeing Heiko Maas call out Wang Yi in a press conference only a few weeks ago after the threat by the Chinese Communist Party against uh, the Czech government for the trip of the Czech Senate president to Taiwan indicates that actually movement is happening and that reform is beginning to get, uh, beginning to draw uh, support from countries that had formerly only focused on the economic relationship. This is going to be incredibly important if we're going to be able to balance and reform our international system so that the 70 or so years mostly of peace and prosperity that we've enjoyed are able to continue for another 70 into the future. few minutes left. Um, in his input, Tom Tugendhat was it already hinting at some of the things that we might need to do. Uh, we've been taking stock of where we stand, uh, how things have shifted. Uh, but now I think the more challenging question is what we are really prepared to do um, in order to face the challenges that we've been uh, describing during this panel. So I will ask each of you and really uh, sharp in two minutes each, and we're going to follow the same order, starting from Italy and then moving on to Sweden and conclude with Poland. Hearing a couple of ideas, and if you can also be a bit concrete on two or three, two or three key must-have ingredients that European countries need to factor in uh, their China policies uh, going forward. Um, Lia Quartabelle, thank you. You're muted. First of all, we have to uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, we cannot influence China only through trade. Uh, we are aware of this, but we haven't said it clearly, loudly, together as Europeans. Um, and this is the first take. Then for, from a more concrete point of view, there are two things that we have to do. I think one thing is to protect the security of our data and to protect our uh, strategic infrastructure of communication, uh, especially 5G and developing European level projects in this respect, not only national projects. I know it's complicated. I know we always say it with the recovery fund, it's the time to do it. Uh, secondly, we have to review our instruments to support those that fight for freedom and for human rights within China. Uh, we make a lot of statements in support of Hong Kong to defend uh, the Muslims in Xinjiang, but in the end, what exactly do we do to support them? I think our instruments go are, are not that effective and we should review them and find more effective instruments to give a concrete help to those people. Thank you. Um, Ulf Christensen. Well, I guess, I mean, everybody understands that it's quite easy to write a strategy. It's extremely complicated to implement it. It's extremely complicated to be, to be influential and successful uh, in relationship to China. Uh, I would say a few things. First, just uh, kind of admit the fact uh, I was mentioned here before, we had hopes for China going through business and economy to more friendly relationships also in politics. We, ha we were wrong, basically. So just to admit that, not treat China in, a, in that kind of naive way we used to do, but that is a starting point. Secondly, I would say that, uh, I mean, there are many details in, in, into what single countries can do, but basically I would say 
Europe won't be successful unless Europe has one united voice. We need to be have a joint action in in, in, in European politics, and in in Europe, I include the UK, obviously. UK is extremely important in that sense. So a more, a more um, comprehensive and, and a united European voice is absolutely needed. I'm pretty concerned, honestly, about the 17 plus one cooperation, even though different countries take it different, different, differently seriously. Um, but obviously Europe is divided. And thirdly, of course, regardless what we think about US foreign policy in general, regardless what we think about the rhetorics, I think Europe needs to understand that there is a more uh, united US view uh, uh, now than before, and that Europe and the US needs to, to uh, cooperate uh, uh, towards China if there is any chance for the Western world to be successful in, in, in competition and in, uh, in, um, in relationship to China, basically. Thank you. Radov Zelasikorski. Well, one idea I've mentioned already, uh, and uh, it's already been mentioned in the State of the Union, a Magnitsky-type um, uh, act that would allow us to impose personal sanctions on the authors of um, human rights abuses, authors and their families, I would say, uh, to make it effective. And my second uh, practical suggestion would be to create um, a, a coordinating committee. Uh, it was called COCOM in the old days, and um, it was uh, to do with transfers of technology to the former Soviet bloc. Um, I believe we should now have um, a coordinating committee between Europe, United States, and some key democratic Asian allies that would coordinate not only the transfers of technology, uh, but also minimum standards on incoming uh, investments and on um, uh, the um, standards of production of various goods. You know, the Chinese undercut us because they have no qualms about certain kinds of experiments or about misusing the data of their own citizens. And we should not be taken advantage in that either. But we can only succeed, not just as uh, uh, Europe, but as the West as a whole. And I believe there should be a strong interest in this uh, from, from Washington, even under this administration. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And thanks for contributing your ideas uh, to our conference. Uh, I hope we will be able soon to transform some of those into reality and it's definitely good news that already today there was indeed an endorsement in the State of the Union speech by the Commission President to move forward with the Magnitsky Act. Um, so a lot of work ahead to be done, uh, but there's nothing left to say for me than thanking you all, thanking our audience here at Merricks and online for following us and especially thanking you for your input. Thank you so much and I hand it over back to Miko Hotari. All right, wonderful. Uh, I think um, this has been an, a very rich day indeed, and I can only conclude by saying thank you to everyone who's been involved here. Uh, indeed, everyone in the audience online, in the live stream, live here in the room um, for going on this journey with us. Um, my special thanks go to the panelists. Uh, obviously, great contributions uh, um, this morning, ranging from the ambassador to uh, colleagues who are more in the strategic thinking um, um, uh, business, but also now parliamentarians, so a great variety of speakers on very relevant issues. And But now is also the time to thank everyone who has been extremely helpful and um, active in the background. And uh, let me just not go by names, but say that the communications and event team have been extremely um, busy and um, uh, very much would like to thank you for all of your work on this. Um, also the IT support and the technical support for a hybrid format that is quite a challenge. Um, thank you for that. And I think we've learned a lot and uh, certainly will try to um, um, do that exercise once more. Um, 
Finally, also thanks to my colleagues who've moderated. Silke Wetter is already back in Brussels, hopefully, um, but also um, others who have joined in to um, make this a very good um, and lively conference. Also, obviously, authors and contributors from um, the team. I, I don't want to um, wrap this up without a short um, um, takeaway. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's quite clear that the seriousness and the complexity of the challenges have been coming out of in this conference quite clearly, uh, and also the possibility for disruption as we move into uh, the election season, well, no, really the election high time in the United States and um, all of what is happening in our relationship with China already. Um, one, another takeaway really from that session here is beyond trade and investment, um, there's much to do on China policy. And um, uh, in one of our sessions, um, Ms. Maria Patin Martin Pratt talked about the sectoral dimension of our foreign policy. And I think also the um, commissioner, um, uh, cabinet chief of the uh, vice uh, president of the commission mentioned that um, very clearly. The sectoral dimension of our foreign policy. Everything is China policy today to some extent. Um, um, we also heard about the need for better coordination. And uh, what I take away from the day today is that um, there was quite a degree of optimism uh, about the actual um, alignment that we've already achieved and also the possibilities of moving forward. I assume that parliamentarians will play a much more important role on these issues going forward. Um, and um, with that, I think we, we are uh, certainly um, not on a track that is um, uh, reason for pessimism. Um, I would like to close with a um, 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 note on our publication. Uh, which you can all read online. It's about a principled first approach on European China policy. Um, and uh, I think we've tackled many of the issues uh, in this conference today that we also try to um, tackle in the publication. So very much look forward to um, all of you discussing these issues going forward and to exchanges with you and um, to further um, um, discussions on these issues. So um, Mary's paper on China. A uh, great conference, great um, uh, audience indeed here in the room. So thank you very much and um, a good evening. Uh, enjoy the terrace and everyone online. Uh, enjoy your evening also wherever you are. Thank you and good night. <laughs>